Hey, my name is Will Brewey. My name is Kelly Nasbrohov. We're building the world's first bioreactor with a gravity off switch. And unfortunately, we got to go to space to do it. All right, let's go check out uh, the Varda shop. Welcome to Varda, uh, where we make spacecraft to manufacture drugs in microgravity. Imagine a world where you had you know, bioreactors that were used in the pharmaceutical industry, but they had no capability of actually influencing their temperature. Effectively, what Varda is doing is creating a net new bioreactor that has a new switch that nobody else is capable of accessing, which is a gravity switch. Our pharmaceutical customers will come to us with a formulation challenge. The first step to drug development is synthesis, figure out what the molecule is to do to the body. The next step is formulation. How do we administer that drug to the body in the most convenient form for the patient. And microgravity effectively enables completely net new formulations that are what are possible on the ground. It's one of the four fundamental forces of physics. Being able to actually manipulate that when it's typically been a you know constant in the equations that pharmaceutical scientists use, now instead we make it a variable. So previously a drug that was only able to be administered via an intravenous drip that would take one to four hours, now instead you can make a subcutaneous version syringes that you can take in the safety and comfort of your own home. We're a pharmaceutical company. We just happen to have to go to space in order to give ourselves the gravity off switch. So you're humanity's first space drug wars. Oh yeah. God. The idea of formulating drugs in space isn't a new one. It's been around for decades. Fortunately, the cost of launch has just been too high to do it before. The way to keep rockets reusable and rapid and perpetual is to create economic demand for them. There's been great developments over the past 20 years in groups like you know, Starlink, Astronis, Planet Labs, you know, ISI. Beyond those use cases, there hasn't really been an obvious need for really mass scale human presence in orbit. And I've always really thought that in-space manufacturing was going to be that thing that would eventually create that need economically without the support of US government so if shipping is just shipping, then it's easy to ship to outer space to take microgravity's effect on specific chemical compounds for drug formulations. You know, originally starting out in Silicon Valley and thinking, man, I'm not gonna be able to work in this like, you know, ideal version of aerospace until I'm like, you know, 40 years old, to at age 25 suddenly realize like, oh, there is actually a much nearer term path. You no longer had to be a billionaire to start a space company. You just had to be, well, probably friends with a billionaire. When it became apparent that like this was actually a pretty good idea, it was not really a decision per se. It was, you know, so people were like, oh, well, like, how did you make the decision? I was like, I, I didn't, you know, it's, I just have to. And so we're the first people in the world to actually bring this to the market as a business rather than as just an academic idea. This is our, the first spacecraft we built, uh, kind of the prototype, if you will. We threw it out of an airplane. We threw it through temperature cycling. She's been, uh, she's been through a lot. The second version of this one is the one that's currently in orbit today. Separated from the rocket and is now in orbit by itself. A couple of weeks ago, we did the pharmaceutical manufacturing of the drug ritonavir. That took about a day to create a unique polymorph. Then um, in a couple of weeks to a month, uh, we'll do what's called a deorbit burn. So this is what will be coming through the atmosphere at Mach 25 all the way down to Utah. Parachutes come out and the pharmaceuticals are kept inside. Every single piece of our puzzle has been done before. Launch, we purchase. Satellite bus, we purchase. Formulation of the drug on orbit has been done on the ISS before. Reentry has been done before. So we're only novel in the aggregate, but the development of the first spacecraft was a ton of fun because you get to do it from scratch. It's a whole new application. And you know, we kind of had this like maniacal simplicity attitude where we're like, what is the quickest way to get working hardware in orbit? The key to success in the aerospace industry is get the hardware off the ground early and often. If hardware is on the ground and you're in the aerospace industry, you're losing, but if you can get it off the ground, you have a chance for success. We have a multitude of use cases. Our primary commercial one is we formulate these pharmaceuticals in orbit. In order to optimize the spacecraft to do that, it's also the same optimization function if you want to do a hypersonic test bed. And so the Air Force pays us to do that and share their data with them. What's something hard about building an aerospace company you or people in general wouldn't expect to be as hard as it is? That is an interesting question. The hardest thing about Varda is integrating two products into, right? We have the spacecraft platform for microgravity, but we also have to do the drug formulation that requires microgravity. This is the only place in the world where you're gonna find hypersonics, spacecraft, and pharmaceutical drugs all in one roof. <laughs> all right. So the worst part about being CEO at a spacecraft company is not getting to be in mission control anymore. So when I was at SpaceX, I flew eight missions to the International Space Station from Mission Control for Cargo Dragon, and it is an absolute blast. There is nothing more fun to me than sitting on console and flying the spacecraft. I have no necessary background to ever get to be in mission control, but I like doing it when occasionally there's a spare console, and uh, yeah. Rui came up with the term of uh, when I like to you know, <laughs> stop in, he calls it a gentleman's mission control. Well, what's the, what's the lowest terrain you're gonna fly over? 9,300. Okay, yeah. so you're gonna have to be at 10,500. 10, yeah. Which, so you're already at the oxygen limit. 
No, 12,500 is the oxygen limit. Okay, that is true. What's your guys' favorite and least favorite thing about working with each other? Both <laughs> <laughs> what's, our, what's the least favorite thing about working with Delian? I mean, obviously his tweeting. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something I have to call him about every once in a while. Delian, you can't tweet that right now. <laughs> Favorite? You're supposed to have a positive version. <laughs> oh, version favorite thing, all right. Honestly, I think it's just that a dedicated, consistent, intelligent thought partner that has the same value foundation that I see for Varda, and so I can always go to him to stress test ideas and cross-check each other. I think of myself as somebody that's like great at intellectual debate, not particularly great at people management or getting people aligned around a vision, and so I think my favorite part of Brewery is he is just like the world's best like aerospace engineering technical recruiter and keeping them like aligned and focused on a particular vision. Probably like my least favorite, you know, part about Brewery is that like after we've clearly decided on something, I thought a week later he loves to just go back to the details and like. Uh, let me tell you about how I wake up, and you tell me which part of this isn't crazy inspiring. So I wake up, uh, drive my little uh, two-seater convertible to uh, the spaceship factory where I work with the most talented people I could find in the entire world. Build spacecraft to help people by creating new formulations for pharmaceuticals. We're doing so on the back of Falcon 9, which is something that uh, me and several other folks here used to work on. The very end product we're making is something that makes someone's life better back on Earth. I can't fathom a more inspiring way to start my day. There's a lot of ways to obviously, you know, contribute to the world. Interview, you know, uh, startup founders on a, you know, Saturday, write phenomenal books. You know, one of the areas of impact that I'm most passionate about to humanity is sort of twofold. One, the field of physics, which to me is effectively the field of just understanding the universe around you. How does it operate? Why do the things happen the way that they do? And second, the world of engineering, which is effectively influence and impact, you know, sort of that world. And We've heard from a variety of our different pharmaceutical scientist partners that they would much prefer to do all formulation of pharmaceuticals in space. Eventually an industrial park in orbit that is doing mass scale manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, fiber optics, all these very sensitive materials that you can create higher quality versions of in the microgravity environment. The kind of the near term success goal, you can go camping at Utah next to our landing site and we can see more than one shooting star per night bringing grandma's medication back. If we have capsules coming from space at that cadence, that means we have hit our first goal. The thing that really motivates me and inspires me every single day is in some ways reflected in the one liner of you know, Varda's core mission, which is expand the economic bounds of humankind. The only way to make humanity a multi-planetary species is to ensure that there's economic activity basically happening in space, that because we've established this really strong trading post, there's still momentum and this flywheel's kicked off and it's just completely unstoppable. Thank you for watching the fourth episode of S3. We did the whole like little logo rebrand too. You saw that. Thank you to Delian and Will for letting me come to the facility in El Segundo and check out Varda. Historically in aerospace, telecom is the only driver of launch needs. And it's really exciting to see space manufacturing becoming a thing. We're living in the future. This is nuts. Uh, I think this is one of the coolest episodes yet. And speaking of cool episodes, we have some insane ones coming up the next few weeks. Very excited to show them to you. Also, I should note, like, the show is changing so much. Like, each week we're trying new things out. This week we tried out to, we tried out this idea of, like, not explaining things as much and linking, like, info clips or the blog, which I'm kind of behind on. But, uh, you know, the goal is that we don't explain things in the videos so that they're more inspirational and exciting and, like, get you pumped, you know, to go build stuff and, you know, change the world. Point being, uh, bear with me while I figure out the best way to make the show really awesome. If you ever have ideas, also very open to hear them in the replies. And thank you for all the support. Keep on building the future. And I'll see you next week when things get fashionable.